as we are uh, going to do a deep dive on our children and young adults um, and their mental health crises, because that is the highest rising suicidality, mental health incidents and prevalence that we, we have been seeing. So we're really thrilled to have um, a panel of experts um, who approach um, mental health from different perspective. Um, yeah. And we would love to start with introductions and we could definitely introduce you, but I think we could, you could do a better job in introducing yourself and, and share with us what, what was, why are you passionate about uh, mental health in, in young adults and children? So Arshina, before we, can I just, uh, cause I don't think, I, I want people to ask their questions in the Q and A and, um, and so we, I'm not sure we prompted them to do that. So I just want to make sure that yes. these know that they can ask questions. Absolutely. Since this is a new panel, this is kind of house, housekeeping. Um, you do see at the bottom of your screen a Q&A session. So for all the audience, if you don't mind typing away your questions, we will keep on taking on these questions as we are speaking to our panel experts. Um, and um, if you would like to ask that live, we could we could bring you on live or you could type away the question. And of course, tweet away as you're listening to some key findings and, and um, topics. So with that, I would love to uh, bring in our, our panelists here and um, I'll go down the tiles that I'm seeing and clockwise patterns. So I see Helen as the first tile onto my right. Helen, uh, welcome. Hi. So uh, we'll, we'll, if you don't mind introducing yourself and then why are you passionate about this topic? Sure. So I'm a journalist. I'm Irish. I'm based in the UK. Um, I've been at The Economist since 2005 and I'm currently on leave of absence working for a new advocacy group in the UK called Sex Matters. And the particular issue that I think Bambi wants me to be here for is uh, the social contagion of what, might, what we might call gender ideation, which is very much spreading online and where the UK and some other European countries, in particular Finland and Sweden, are really starting to worry a lot about the way that children are um, basically picking up ideas from each other online, like as a sort of a, a social media influenced and uh, also, to some extent, school influenced movement and what this is doing to their mental health and well being, and how mental health providers should best support this fast changing and sometimes quite vulnerable group. Great, thank you. And why are you passionate about being in this space? I mean, if we can't look after children who need help, then really nothing else is worth doing. You know, it is kind of that simple, isn't it? Like, they're the people who you hope you can set on a good life path. And if you can get it right when they're little, then you know, they can grow up to be the sort of adult who help the next generation of children. Excellent, thank you. Um, I see Ed, Ed, can you introduce yourself and, and share why you're passionate about working in this space? <clears throat> sure, um, so my name is Ed Goss and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Mantra Health. Uh, we started this company about Four years ago and uh, focus on the uh, young adults population. So we work directly with colleges and uh, universities to deliver um, a comprehensive mental health program that uh, covers um, all of their students. Uh, today we work with um, you know over 100 in college ca campuses and 800,000 students enrolled across uh, these campuses. So um, you know have seen some exciting scale in the last two years. Definitely. Uh, a big evolution of, uh, you know, what's happening within this population. Um, and the reason why I, I started this company is primarily because I actually had a sibling that dropped out of college because um, of her, uh, of her own mental health. And um, yeah, I'll be, I'll be glad to, to kind of, you know, speak about, speak about that and, and happy to be here to uh, have the conversation. That's great. Thank you. Welcome, Ed. Um, I see Divya. Um, Divya, if you don't mind unmuting. Oh, we can't. Yeah. Oh, there you go. I, we can hear you. Yes. All right. Um, I'm Divya Shah. I am um, 
I work at Meta, but at Meta, I focus on privacy. So I'm thinking about privacy for all of our users and and youth and specif- uh, spe- especially. Um, but I'm not here representing Meta. I just want to be clear. I've been in the medical health, digital health space for a really long time before Meta and my current role. Um, I've worked at Samsung and we've built uh, health products. I've been part of the health investment community as well. And uh, mental health is one uh, topic that is very close. I have a 15-year-old son who's addicted to devices, like all his friends, and it's just very personal and hits home for me. And there's always a contradiction because, you know, I work at a company uh, that is the number one social media company in the world. Um, and there's lots of chatter around how social media affects youth. And uh, hopefully I can provide a, a unique perspective there uh, to this panel. Thank you, Divya. I'm looking forward to it. Um, I have Rebecca, who's next on my tile. Uh, Rebecca, welcome. Yeah, thanks for thanks for having me. Um, so I'm Rebecca Egger, CEO and co-founder of a company called Little Otter. We are a comprehensive mental health platform for children and their families, um, specifically focused on children zero to 14. So how do we um, actually improve identification and assessment of mental health disorders of the youngest of the young kiddos to make sure that we can provide high quality interventions to everyone um, to set them up for success in teenagehood and adulthood? Great. Thank you. And why are you passionate about it? I mean, I think the other panelists mentioned, I mean, I always, what I say about Little Otter is like, what if we could build a world where kids got mental health care when they needed it? 50% of all mental health disorders occur before the age of 14. Rarely are they identified or treated. And the reason is because it's hard. It's different. Providing mental health care for children and giving them the support they need is really complex. You have to look at the family system. You can't just look at the individual. Uh, So it's critical for the future success of our world that we're supporting kids um, as early as possible. Great. Thank you. Catherine, welcome. Um, could, Could you introduce yourself and share your passion around this topic? Yes, thank you for having me. I'm Catherine Saxby. I am a child and adolescent psychiatrist. Um, I'm very interested in the topic of social media and how it affects the normal child and adolescent development, how it affects the peer groups, how it affects self-image and self-worth. I have seen that a lot of platforms and a lot of forums that are sort of selling themselves as communities and connection actually create a lot more distance and a lot more self-consciousness, a lot more questioning. I've talked to so many adolescents who have had, who they thought were friends online, who then turned out to be people who are not who they say they are. Because when people go online, you choose your avatar, you choose your persona. Um, And so I see an entire generation of children who are having what they would call relationships and friendships um, with just fantasy persona and they themselves are not completely honest and sincere. And I see the toll that this takes um, on kids and how it affects their ability or inability to relate to the people in real life um, and how the social media platforms can actually replace our face-to-face relationships where we learn to tolerate being left out or feeling bad or someone being mean to us, um, which we seem to want to take away from the experience of adolescence. We want to protect our children from feeling like they've been excluded. Of course we do, but that is also a normal part of adolescence and being able to feel discomfort and to feel unwanted and yet to survive that. That's what builds resilience and that's what creates mature adults. So that is primarily uh, what drove me to be uh, a participant on this panel. That's, that's, you're welcome. Thank you. And 
maybe we will begin our conversation with you, Catherine, because you are at the forefront of meeting the kids and 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 um, and delivering care. And you know, being a physician myself, whenever a pill or an intervention is is provided to the patient, it goes through the phase trials. It goes through all of the, you know, looking at the, the intended effects and unintended side effects of, of a thing. We put a smartphone and social media in the hands of our, our, our adults, young adults with a forming brain. Uh, we, we do see nearly 94% of, of kids in that age group, especially the teens and adolescents, they use YouTube or TikTok or 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 Meta or other kinds of social media on a regular basis, and we do see that uh, there is on the side, on a parallel side, we see this um, escalating rise of su suicidality, suicide ideation. Um, uh, the new Pew research actually looks at the usage patterns, and then also nearly thirty percent increase in, in suicidality, which is a staggering number for 15 to 20 years um, kids. So I wanted to ask you, um, as we look at this cult-like almost following of, of um, use of uh, smartphones and, and really shifting or dysmorphic relationships with their peers through, through texting or, or other media form, I see that in my kid who is 19 year old, like they could be sitting, the friends could be sitting in the same room, but they're communicating through their smartphones. And so that's kind of the dependency on that. Is that normal? Like, is that new norm that we are going to live with? And do we need to adjust around it? Or is that something that we need to be worried about and 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 uh, almost peel back the intervention that that has led to intended or unintended consequences. I would say if you're using the word normal to mean common, then yes, that's very common. And we see that behavior all the time and it looks normal because all the adolescents are doing that. But normal in terms of healthy mental development. No, that's not normal. That's that's not how humans evolve to relate to one another. Um, actually, we have an incredible ability through all of our senses to pick up on voice, body language, expression, micro expression, um, changes even in things like the muscular tension in a person's face. We, we were made to have face-to-face -face communication with one another. And so our communication as human beings is so much more than just words on a, on a screen. Um, and I would even say that the majority of our communication with other people is subtext and is nonverbal. Non um, and so to lose that really means losing a sense of how we relate to each other as, as human beings. And the basis of all relationships is, is trust and respect. And if you don't feel like you can tell where somebody is coming from emotionally when you're talking to them, then you don't build that rapport that leads to meaningful long-term relationships. And, and most everything is very superficial and it's just quite literal. And since it's very hard to convey any kind of tone of voice when you're writing, now we have all of these emojis that exist that can show like, oh, this is meant to be ironic, or this is meant to make you laugh, or, you know, this is meant to be sad. And so we have to insert all of these, you know, kind of one-dimensional little cartoon pictures, because we can't actually pick up on any of the nuance in just texting. That's, um, that's interesting that you mentioned around, it's not the norm, it's what is common. And, and that's kind of a distinguished, uh, distinguishing thing that we all kind of need to become aware of. I would wanna bring Divya into that conversation. And I know that we're not gonna pick on Meta, but uh, I would love to hear about what you are seeing in your, um, in your space, um, especially now that we see that there is some level of causal uh, data that we are seeing mental health um, social media has on mental health. We had a study that came out 
from Tel Aviv uh, and MIT that shows there's a causal effect between the use of mental health, uh, uh, social media and mental health. So what are you seeing, especially from, from tech companies um, uh, that they are doing to prevent and intervene and, and maybe even morph the experience of, of the teen, teen and adolescents? That's right. Yeah, I think, um, you know, tech companies, whether even texting or even having a smartphone in your hand at the age of eight or nine um, is going to be a challenge we all face as a society. Um, but these are, you know, when I, uh, not defending social media companies, but there are equal number of studies and research that talk about the positive aspects of being connected online, finding your community. Um, there are many scenarios where we've seen uh, teenagers, adolescents going through um, gender identity issues where they've found a community online, where they've connected and they've found the support. Um, so there is, you know, when you think about, when you step back and think about technology and the evolution of technology, when the internet first came out, um, there was a lot of scare as well around that, you know, it can be used, it's, it's technology is that, just that, it's a medium, it can be used for the good, bad and the ugly, and that is what we are seeing with social media, it can be used for the good, bad and ugly, um, and so there's how the, quite the challenge for us is how do we balance the good and make sure we prevent the bad, right, so I think that that balance is really hard to strike, um, Meta, along with other companies, have constantly asked for um, them to be regulated, right? Because it's really hard problem. I work in privacy and my constant battle is how do I balance privacy of youth online with safety of youth online and monitoring of youth online, right? These are, again, conflicting, contradictory, but very valuable tenants of, of how we want social online behavior to happen, um, we do want to value privacy of, of you know, everyone in the, in the world across the globe. Um, and But when we start monitoring for signals and trying to identify what the, um, the kid or the youth is going through, whether they're going through mental issues, what kind of content they are exposed to, what kind of co conversations they're exposed to, we start interfering with their privacy. So this is, this is a constant challenge I think all tech companies are facing. Um, but there is a lot technology companies can do. I think you you all raise a very important point. You know, what is the future we want? How do we strike the balance? Is striking the balance the responsibility of governments, regulators, of tech companies, or parents? Like that is a big debate happening, right? Like who regulates who? Um, if we start as tech companies start to intervene, then are we taking a stance? And what happens? You know, what do we want to get into that business has always been a very challenging um, line for us to draw and and hold. Um, so it is a very challenging space. You know, it's not easy. Um, but there have you know I can cite a few examples. Um, at least Meta has tried to identify toxic conversations and posting, public posting, not not post private conversations, but public posting and and trying to raise a flag saying, is this truly something you want to send to your friend? It's called the restrict feature. Um, it's trying to, you know, we, we think uh, there's a lot of research and from the research, we believe that if if we are, asked to stop before we we do a, a, a behavior we are stopped asked to stop and think that we might not make that mistake and as teenagers we we all know they they're impulsive they want to react they want to be cool um and so that the restrict features become is quite popular and adopted quite uh, quite widely um i think we we've also tried to um obfuscate or blur certain um, triggering images that talk about suicide or talk about body shaming or body image issues. Um, and this is just, I think, the beginning of what we are trying to do. I think we can do a lot more here, um, but definitely need to partner with um, with uh, experts in the space and even, you know, uh, public policymakers, regulators, and trying to see what what is the best path forward. Um, in terms of striking that balance between 
between the youth and the kids being able to leverage the goodness of a social media platform, the connectivity, but also uh, not get um, not get influenced by the negative aspects of it. Um, so there is work to be done, um, but it's not all bad, right? Like I think there's that is that is the challenge that we we face uh, on a day to day basis. Absolutely. And, and of course, you know, the, the business uh, needs and, and the governance will always have a fight uh, in a way. So, and, and I know Catherine is, um, uh, is off right now. Uh, maybe she would like to uh, elaborate just a tiny bit on, onto that discussion. But I wanted to quickly bring in Ed because, you know, I think social media usage is quite high in the, in the university settings. To some extent, even the homeworks and the, and the classwork and coursework comes through social media. So there's no getting away from it. But like, yeah. Uh, so not just looking at social media, but what are the trends you're seeing in your population? Um, and and what is what have you seen in terms of the mental state and and the driving um, you know problems, uh, whether it's social media or more. Yeah, there's definitely more, and and I I would say it's it's unfair to to blame it all on social media. I think social media has become this like go to place for everyone to blame the sort the, the the mental health crisis that's happening amongst our youth, and uh, and I just think it's too it's a little bit too easy. I, I think it's acted as an accelerator uh, that there needs to be some accountability on on social media companies. Uh, that needs to happen at the at the government level. It needs to happen in partnership with, <clears throat> excuse me, clinicians. Um, but I think what's what's really important to talk about here as well is the what are the other trends and whether what, what are the other drivers. Um, uh, we we haven't we haven't talked about uh, how, for example, the pandemic has accelerated mm -hmm. um, the you know uh, the the effects of of loneliness, anxiety. Uh, and trauma amongst the young adult population, but that's something that we've seen uh, a tremendous amount of in terms of the population that we're we're treating. Imagine going from you know effectively the most social experience that you could possibly go through, which is going on a college campus, um, to overnight being you know confined in in your room where you know you're you're at risk of being affecting or affecting others. Um, and without an ability to go see your your parents really as well because you might put them at risk too. So um, I think that you know over the last two years has probably been one of the biggest drivers. Um, and another one that uh, we're seeing as a big trend is also climate change. Um, it's emerging as one of the leading presenting uh, issues of anxiety uh, in the young adult population. But um, I think that Gen Z is a is a generation that is. Uh, extremely conscious socially about um, <clears throat> things like like climate change, which uh, as a uh, presenting issue, as a subfield within clinical psychology is starting to grow in terms of th figuring out what are the, the right types of evidence-based therapies uh, to treat that. And then there's also, you know, been a lot of the, the um, you know, social injustice. Um, and all of that, when combined with social media that's surfacing, you know, um, you know, you need to you need to engage in you know climate change support. You need to engage in the Black Lives Matter movement. There's a lot of just general pressure as well on the ge the generation that I think genuinely cares is educated, but is also feeling the the you know you you could call it you know sort of like a, a positive peer pressure in that situation to wanting to make a change. But how much can I really impact by using my platform? Um, and um, I think that in, in and of itself is creating anxiety. Um, so those are just some of my thoughts. Um, and then we didn't talk about much about sort of like cyber, cyber bullying. Yes. Um, you know, my, my sense is that uh, there is obviously a, a, a huge amount of benefits from the communities that can be found uh, on social media platforms in terms of emulating some of the benefits you might see in group therapy. I also think that uh, it could really go both ways. Uh, you know, if you find yourself in a you know suicide support group and you have someone that um, you know comes in there and, and says the wrong things, right? Um, as part of a as part of a group, and that's why you know I think that um, 
the use of communities and social media for the benefits of mental health need to be evidence-based and clinically guided as well. And so whether that comes from social media companies or um, digital health companies that are trying to build community features, um, it's really, really important to think through um, moderation, um, whether that is uh, with a human in the loop or through um, artificial intelligence technology, um, and likely you'll need both. Um, to me, that that is also quite uh, quite important to talk about. That's that's great. Thank you, Ed. Um, and I I understand that you know kids are more mature and uh, or the Gen Z is more mature when they arrive in the age that you're um, you're addressing. But as we get a little bit younger, that's when the double-edged sword becomes even bigger for, the, for that population. So Rebecca, what are the trends you are seeing, especially in much, much younger kids and their families that are coming yeah. to the health crises? Well, I think that this is what I, what I was going to say kind of with all of this is we actually see a very interesting different trend. And I would say the biggest impact that social media and phones are having on children are parents engaging with these resources instead of their children. Mm -hmm. And we see this by, with feedback, kids are saying, you know, mommy's working on the phone, they're pretending to pick up the phone, they're, you know, trying to get their parents' attention. The biggest thing that we can do to improve a child's mental health is to spend time with them and play with them one-on-one -on -one, face to face. That is what we should be doing. And yes, these young children are playing with their phones, but they're emulating their parents. They're following what their parents are doing. And more and more parents are spending their downtime on these different apps on their phone, not engaging directly with their kids. And so I also want to make sure that in this conversation, we look at what is the responsibility of parents to show good habits and good behavior, because that's where this education comes from. And that's why so much of our program is around parent work as well as child, right? Because you can't just tell a kid, all right, go off, you know, social media, but when you're home, your parents are doing it, right? There's, that's, there's this disconnect. So you really have to look at, or a teacher or anyone else that's interacting with a kid in that community. Um, so I think that's a really, really important factor is that this is not just, you know, a child's responsibility, right? This is about how does the family manage and support their overall mental health um, and interact with each other and show this good behavior. And I think also there are so many other things that are, you know, as Ed was saying, that are impacting the crisis that we're going through right now. I think social media definitely has a big impact on it and kids are seeing things and learning stuff that's been happening, but mental health issues, just like anything else in the population, you know, they're, they existed before the pandemic, they exist now, right? And it's about how do we better treat these issues? How do we make sure that we, you know, um, identify them as early as possible? and make sure that we support our kids because if it wasn't social media, as Ed was saying, it's climate change, it's, uh, there's, there's all, it's the pandemic. There's so many other factors that will continue to exasperate, uh, exasperate it. And Rebecca, especially, you know, as we see in some of the studies, especially the EPIC research showed that the girls are disproportionately more impacted. Yeah. Um, and, and both on like, things like eating disorders or suicidal ideation um, far outweighing, and of course the boys have the same similar crises too in their own cohort, yeah. but the girls are disproportionately getting more impacted by yeah. it. That's something- And I will also, I, will, I mean, I'm so glad we're having this conversation. I will say we have a specific path for kids that come to us for with suicide ideation. We do specific training work the average age of a kid that we see with suicide ideation is nine years old. That is the average that we see. That's the highest group of them. Um, so it is definitely impacting these kids. And a lot of these kids, I would tell you, are, do not have phones. They do not have social media yet, right? There's other things that, that are going on. Um, so, you know, I think, but yes, it's definitely dispropor disproportionately affecting women and girls. The other thing is that for children, 
usually the way that mental health issues are identified are because their actions, their feelings are disrupting the adults around them, right? If you think about the typical young kid who's diagnosed, it's a nine-year-old boy with ADHD who can't sit still in class, right? Because they're annoying and they're bothering the teacher, they're bothering parents. But especially young girls often suffer silently. And that's also a huge problem that we need to address as we think about social media, as we think about identification, as we think about treatment. You know, if you're dealing with an eating disorder, there's a lot of shame. There's a lot of other things that you're sitting on. And so how do we improve education and awareness and communication that says that's just as valuable to treat as the kid who's annoying their teacher in class? Because <laughs> it can be silent, right? So yes. Okay, uh, go ahead, Emby. Um, I, I love what Rebecca is doing because it's so true that parents do have to, I feel like you're sort of lecturing me as a parent to get off my devices. And, but it's so, it's so true, but I, but importantly, I really like the fact that you bring the parent into the conversation because it's really important for parents to have a role in raising their children. And there's one area that we haven't really discussed. Uh, it's an area of fear as well, but it's an area where I see parents being pushed out of the conversation when they really need to be part of it. Um, we had with us, uh, and he didn't introduce himself, but Alex Caraglian, uh, he is from Harvard, he's from Fenway Institute. I want everyone to know that I've reached to a number of people to have a conversation around gender confusion, uh, because it is a big conversation these days. And apart from, as Ed mentioned, um, and also Rebecca mentioned the sphere of social justice, warranted or not, overblown or not, everybody has their thoughts on those. Uh, but there is a fear that is revolving around little children these days that their voices aren't heard, their identities aren't heard. And it is uh, a big, huge problem. Some people might even say it's a social contagion. Um, so I wanted Alex here, um, and unfortunately, he decided he didn't want to join us, uh, but we do have Helen here, uh, Helen from Sex Matters, to talk about the rise in sort of this um, gender confusion. But I also want to legitimize the fact that there is a certain population of children who do have gender dysphoria. Um, so I, I want to recognize that they exist out there. The problem is how do you identify, how do you find these children? And this was the question I wanted to pose to Alex, but um, Helen is here. So um, she has a lot of, she's done a lot of work in this, particularly with the UK's Gender Institute. So um, Helen, we know they exist. How do we find them? That's um, fine. I, I suppose that I would say before the question of finding them is, you know, are we unfortunately and accidentally creating them? So we know that there's been a huge rise in the number of children who experience some sort of gender distress. And, you know, I think that's the question you want to ask first, like, what are we doing as a society that we're, we're making children feel so ill at ease in the body that they have or the identity that they have? And I don't think that's by any means a settled question. I think it's something that people are looking at in different countries. And here in Europe, there's an increasing consensus that at least some of that is mediated by social media and online spaces. And I mean, I'm not a specialist as people here are in these spaces or indeed in child psychology, but our new spec, our new spec, our new specifications for the NHS for gender care for children very much acknowledge that, um, you know, that there can be a contagion, a contagious aspect to this, that there can be a passing phase to it that the children for whom gender becomes uncomfortable and an issue, so absolutely a serious issue, a genuine issue, also have other issues a lot of the time. And that the best way to treat these children is holistically to look right across all of these issues that they have and you know, not just sort of put a child in the gender bucket as soon as they say gender. Um, I would say that the, the two things I'd be really interested in raising in this particular group 
would be one is you know as as divya said it's incredibly difficult for social media companies to balance all these different demands on them for privacy for safety for you know not letting children see things they shouldn't and so on but one thing i think we have to acknowledge is that in social media spaces often children are on their own away from all adults it's the first time in history that we've seen spaces significant spaces that have played a very large part in children's lives where they're learning solely from each other and with no input from adults and I think that's one of the reasons why we see so many things moving so fast through children because children are still developing they're changing they're inexperienced about the world they, they don't have supervision the way that they used to and and so they, they feed each other ideas about how things work and I think that's how you can see this febrile sort of you know, suddenly everybody's worried about climate change and everybody's got to do this, that and the other, you know, th these things run through these groups in ways that are not necessarily healthy and that we're not even seeing that as adults because we're not there. We're not there with them on TikTok. We're not there with them in their, you know, um, uh, uh, fanfic websites or whatever. And the second thing is that, you know, again, with good intentions and with some good results, we've legitimized the talking about mental health by non-professionals over the last 10 or 20 years. We've expected teachers to do more and more to do with mental health. And that's sometimes on the basis of very short courses or maybe just, you know, a fact sheet. And then, you know, I don't know that what they say is always very helpful because you might be accidentally encouraging a child to ruminate who's a child who, you know, that's not what's right for them. But now everybody talks in mental health terms, including children. You know, I talked to a therapist the other day who said that she was amazed at how insightful the kids she was seeing were. Like they all came in and they had all these ideas about what was happening to them. And then after a while, she realized that, you know, that it was just talk. But they're picking these things up from each other as well and, and almost diagnosing themselves and each other in basically child only spaces. I don't think that's very healthy. So those are the things that I'd like to say to this group from our somewhat different perspective here in the UK. And I don't know if any of that resonates with you. And, and and that's that's interesting, Helen. I was reading the article around NHS talking about the transient phase, um, especially when when the gender identity um, discussion happens between the kids and 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 to almost pause um, before jumping into therapeutics because it is causing the the side effects and long term. So, I mean, the, the risk is that you're concretizing something that's maybe an exploratory phase. Absolutely. And, you know, a, a, a skilled a skilled therapist will say, what is this child trying to say to me? That's always what they say to themselves. Like if a child comes in who's cutting or, you yeah. know, is expressing something, what, what is this child trying to express? Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. so so I think, unfortunately, we've tended we've, we've started in many cases to sort of just concretize this identity rather than say, what is this child communicating? And what and the second part that you mentioned is around uh, the non-expert explanation, right? So that's something that that happens on, on. I think even in the U.S. it happens. And Catherine, you probably are seeing is seeing kids getting sex ed at a certain age, um, and which is totally fine. And I think it needs to happen. It's just that not every kid is at, at that maturity level in those in those ages too. So like a kid could be in the lower side of the spectrum. And uh, so some of this education, which is complex and that does have the mental health issues that are, they're tying in now early on, um, need to be almost catered to that, that maturity level of the, of the individual. Because just what you mentioned, Helen, you know, they're just reciting what they are hearing in from from their uh, from their teachers or, or from, from their teachers or from websites, right, and, websites. Yeah. yes absolutely so Catherine is that something that you are seeing in in your uh in your you know environment um the impacts on the kids in and, and yes social media but also beyond that too I do see that I see that on social media I also see that uh in the schools um, sometimes kids will come and talk to me and, and they will have these phrases that are sort of instantly recognizable um, as kind of like a, a prepackaged um, gender identity. And they'll say, well, you know, I feel like, you know, it'll be a girl who will say that, you know, I, I feel that I'm really a boy or vice versa. And I, you know, the question is, well, how do you know what it feels like to be 
a girl or how do you know what it feels like to be a boy and then that kind of stumps I think a lot of the kids because what they may be saying is oh I see that the opposite sex maybe has certain privileges that I am envious of or I see that something is easier for them or I see that my peer who identifies as non-binary or transgender is getting a lot of attention from the counselor and the teacher and the neighborhood and changing names and changing pronouns. And there's sort of like this big celebration about this. Um, and the word authenticity is used a lot to designate that a child who professes themselves to be of the opposite gender. And it's interesting because on the one hand, we're supposed to be non-binary, but it's also impossible to talk about this without saying the opposite gender, which kind of reveals that really we can't get away from the binary. But I see that the word authenticity is used when in fact, I find that a truly much more authentic way to help a child with dysphoria or distress or depression or, or any of the other things that go along with the gender dysphoria um, diagnosis is to help that person accept themselves in their actual physical authentic form. So we're, we're calling something authentic, which actually then requires a lot of pretending. Um, and a child may express a desire to be the opposite sex and can feel sad that they're not the opposite sex. Absolutely that exists. Like Bambi said, gender dysphoria exists. Of course it does. Um, and even for those therapists who are interested in exploratory therapy rather than immediate gender affirmation, it always begins with acknowledging and compassionately respecting that somebody is dysphoric. Um, but the approach is, where is this dysphoria truly coming from? Is this a proxy for some other feeling of self-loathing or some other feeling of self-rejection? Um, what is it that looks better maybe on the other side of the gender fence? Or, or it could be an eating disorder that we haven't really uncovered as Dr. James Le James Greenblatt talked about in the first panel. And um, we often overlook that that these kids are deficient in vitamin D or zinc, et cetera. Um, and we need to be looking there as well. And I think that um, when you were saying that labeling a child a certain way, I think we used to do this, we do this quite often. We used to do this with depression and we quickly label everyone mm -hmm. depressive or bipolar or so on. Um, but I do want to touch on why some people, because Alex isn't here, so I will speak, I guess, for him when I had, I wanted him on because he did do um, a pretty large study on looking at gender dysphoric children, and it showed that, you know, there is a link. This is his, this is his conclusion. There is a link between positive mental health and um, you know, putting your children on puberty blockers or hormones, et cetera. There are a number of people out there who are listening who would probably say that this is a good direction for the kids. I will also say that Alex's study now did not look five years down the line. Um, and so, and there's a lot of kids who are now sitting uncomfortably in their unfortunate decision that they made when they were probably too young to make that. So um, what's the downside of getting this wrong? And this is open to everyone, right? There is a huge downside. We're not just talking about pills and having somebody um, addicted to pills. We're talking about sitting in an entirely different body. Um, what's the downside? Can I and just respond a second about the, the study? So, and I think this relates a lot to what Rebecca was saying, um, that in a relationship between a parent and a child, the, the currency of love and a healthy rapport is attention. It's caring. It's seeing that person and paying attention. And so children who go to gender clinics with their parents 
have a clinician, have a counselor. There's a lot of attention also being paid to the child at that time. And that child feels like they're being seen and listened to and cared for. And I don't think that that has a negligible effect on that sort of immediate, you know, what's being called euphoria um, in, you know, you'll see on social media. Um, I think that has a lot to do with attention and, and being seen. And as Bambi just said, you know, it's important to know what happens years and years down the line. And we do have some results in adults, um, you know, in a very large study at a clinic in the Netherlands who looked at what we're talking about, suicidality. Um, and really found that actually there was an incredibly high rate of suicide post-transition in those people's adult lives. So that needs a lot of attention to, to figure out why that's happening. And, and, and as a follow-up to that question is, are we identifying what came first? Was that a mental health issue leading to the transient phase in, in or gender dysphoria in general, or was that gender dysphoria that led, led to not being seen and led to a mental health issue? So that's why we are all kind of, I feel like we're aligning towards the fact that there has to be a clinical level assessment, a holistic assessment that allows for, for that kid to be better attended to in, in, in a more clinical way than being attended to in, in that what they think a safe space could be uh, groups that are unmoderated um, in, in, in a social setting, a social media setting and things like that. So if I could jump in and say that, um, you know, we've been here before with mental health issues and the way that societies shape them. So I mean, there's a very well established uh, body of knowledge about um, the way that psychosomatic um, diseases are expressed and experienced and the way that that expression is shaped in the clinical setting. So in different countries, the details of how you would feel in your body, how depression feels or how anxiety feels, they vary. And they vary because there's a cultural template for how that experience is in its, in its essence experienced. So we know that we're not just diagnosing, we're also shaping when we, when we enter into a clinical relationship with somebody. This is on any, any, any um, ailment that isn't just really entirely uh, biological and physical. All of them, we shape them too. And I think it's a, there's a famous book um, that was written in the 1990s that looked at the history of psychosomatic illnesses by a chap called Edward Shorter, who's a historian of medicine. And he said very presci presciently in that, he said that media, the media at the time, like newspapers and television, were taking over from doctors as the people and the place where psychosomatic illnesses were being shaped. But now, 20 years later, I think it's social media that are doing a lot of that. And this is a very broad point. This is really nothing to do just with gender. It's to do with all of it. Like, it's the first thing we all do. We go online to, to see how to explain what we feel. And, it, you know, I, th I think like I thought the example of children coming in expressing distress about um, uh, climate change was really interesting. Like, where did that come from? It came from what they're seeing in the culture around them. And it's almost created a new disease, you know, like maybe it's not named as that, but that's how it's being expressed and how it's then being seen in the clinic. And then we react to that and that feeds back. It's just an extraordinarily complex environment. And we can't just say, oh, we just need to get our diagnoses right. Like the way that we're treating these children and the way that we're diagnosing things is actually shaping their experience of their disease. And I wanted to bring... Um you know, Rebecca in this discussion, because she's seeing a, a much, much, much earlier age. Um, are you seeing discussions around, I mean, we are, we're talking about gender dysphoria, but also, you know, more than that, but are you seeing approaches uh, from, from the therapist and more holistic approaches and, and studying the outcomes of those in, in some shape or form? Yeah, well, definitely, you know, I'm not a, a doctor, um, so I will 
you know, share what we've seen, but the expert here is my co-founder, um, Dr. Helen Egger, who's also my mother. That's why we share the same last name. Um, but, I, you know, I think what you were saying uh, was really important because the big thing that we do at Little Otter is provide a holistic assessment. And it's also very important that my mom my co-founder is a doctor. So we have seen actually a rise in um, psychosis or mental health issues that are related to post-COVID illness or infections or really have physical health elements. We cannot just look at mental health isolated and we cannot look at these symptoms isolated. So that is a lot of the science that goes into our approach is what is the holistic issue that is going that is happening exactly for what you said is that people come to us all the time and say, my kid is depressed, anxious, I have ADD. And it's like, well, actually we need to really break this down. And we follow a very clear, you know, cultural based multi-axis assessment um, to get to those conclusions and figure out the treatment that's right for the kids and family. That's great. And Ed, are you seeing, um as we're talking about gender dysphoria, are you seeing the impact of that? And how how is how is your organization, how companies is addressing that in a holistic way? Yeah, I think in, in a similar fashion, you know, we we aim to you know, provide a, a full assessment that also works with, you know, I would say on the ground clinics that sit on college campuses. So for us, um, a lot of what enable enables us to really understand. Um, the journey of any patient that, that comes through a platform, um, you know, partially goes through making sure that uh, we work with the on the ground clinics and actually have um, adequate data to be able to make these assessments. So we actually uh, built our, an extension to our uh, EHR that um, we're able to um, uh, deliver um, to the clinics on the ground so that we exchange notes, we collaborate, and we take a team-based approach at treating uh, patients um, so that they may be seeing someone on the ground um, you know, for uh, a, any presenting issue that requires them to work with someone on the ground and have the ability to uh, treat their mental health virtually through um, our provider group. That's, that's great. Thank you. Uh, and Divya, from what Helen just mentioned, there are spaces that are unmoderated with underage um, forming brains that have arrived there. And so the discussions can go, um, can get skewed and can be impactful, maybe in a negative way. Is there other things that the tech companies are looking at uh, as solutions that provide the expert guidance in that in those spaces that people are already engaged on, or kids or adolescents are already engaged? Yeah, I think um, at Meta, we are looking at various tools to provide, to present relevant content to communities or to a discussion. Say there's a con conversation about um, body image or suicidal tendencies. We are trying to provide uh, content from credible sources. You know, we are not, again, we are just an enabler tech company. So we partner with a lot of institutes on mental health to build the right relevant content, to provide them links to support and support systems in local communities that they can reach out to. Um, there's more work to be done here. Like I said, we are just, you know, uh, starting to understand the problem space a bit more. I think if, to take a few steps back, um, I also advise my 15 year olds, uh, you know, class group on business and investments and, and topics of their interests. And coming from Meta, there's a lot of curiosity around, hey, what's the new next Instagram feature and can you share? And when we talk about building technologies or custom solutions for youth, the youth are repelled by it. So there's also contradiction there, again, to my earlier point about we're working in a space of con contradictions. Um, teenagers don't want to be called youth. They want to follow adult profiles. They want they don't want their parent. So we've we built actually a lot of features around parental consents and parental involvement and supervision. Um, but teen 
kids are are lying like the whole entire group was like oh my age online is you know my year birth year is 1980 something and they all laughed about it so um the kids and especially gen z i think someone mentioned on this panel the gen z is very very aware of online harms they're very um savvy to have circumvented some kids are also circumvented the their online identity and their vpns so that they their ip addresses could not be tracked so they are we, we are working with kids who are very technology savvy they're aware of online harms they're very aware of their online personas and how as they grow that can come to harm so the the topics of conversation that we were having a few years ago with millennials is is different now with gen z and so i think we have to um when i think about mental health you know again i'm no expert on this topic but kids are under a lot of pressure uh, the the teachers are under pressure to perform to churn out overperforming you know kids parents are under a lot of stress there as well the amount of information we are consuming as adults and as kids is exponentially larger than what we we were consuming you know 10 years ago so self regulation is a really hard thing for even adults to do so how are we expecting kids to self regulate effectively right and i think we we have to think about it as as a society again holistically into uh, rebecca's point is what are the different tensions and what is our what are our child, children facing today um you know when i even look at the studies and the curriculum that my son is studying i studied that two years later you know when i was 7 16 or 17 and he's forced to study that today so there's a lot of pressure and is that causing some of this is social media causing some of this is just over information and over exposure to a lot of stories across the board is that you know uh, causing anxiety and stress and and they they are still immature they're still growing do they have the tools to deal with all of this um is is the question when we as as adults are not being able to deal with it appropriately um so i want to leave you with that i think technology companies definitely have a a role to play um and we are doing a lot of research trying to understand every aspect of it and we can build tools um but as we build tools and or as we build roadblocks keep in mind that the generations to come know how to circumvent it as well so we're always playing catch up there yeah and and thank you uh, diva for that and and catherine you you had you raised your hand as you have a question w- one of the follow up comments i do want to introduce is that you know our generation did have a sunset time uh to the tv or or the media that was uh, that was impacting our brain the lack of sleep is one of the biggest factor that kind of feeds into mental health and that 24/7 access to youtube or or tiktok or any other social media component when they just even roll in the bed and they wake up they have their hands on the phone that can disrupt sleep and the and disrupted sleep feeds into uh really really uh making mental health issues for that individual worse um so i wonder if social media can have a sunset time um to their social media experience um okay catherine your turn uh i think you're on mute uh i was i was going to respond to something that divya said that i that i agree with i don't believe that social media creates um mental illness or can take a you know the average healthy adolescent and you know after a few minutes on social media or facebook suddenly they've got a bunch of diagnoses i do think that it really enables a crucible effect where if you have a lot of self doubt and self consciousness or you're worried that there's something wrong with you or you're asking questions there can be a real pile on of of negative reinforcement so you so you wind up in sort of an echo chamber of misery um or you can go down a lot of rabbit holes where there's misinformation um and there can be a lot of reinforcement of um bad habits such as you know disordered eating or self harm or a lot of these activities have a real online community um so it's good when when things are there for support 
but you have to realize that if it's unmonitored and it's a support group for people who are having a lot of distress, they, they will also be there to spread their distress to, to one another. So it's almost like a, a therapy group, um, you know, with no therapist leading it. Um, and in those groups, there may also be people who are posing as children and adolescents. And that, of course, is another concern. I want to um, bring in Ed and Rebecca here because Ed mentioned something about how we can all be responsible somehow. We can all take responsibility as a parent. I think we're all agreeing we can take responsibility as parents. But he mentioned something about, you know, even maybe even social media can have a responsibility. So I, I think you two have a responsibility, Ed and Rebecca, because you have these platforms and services to treat young adults as well as children. I want to bring up this Q&A question that this person brought up. I think it's extremely relevant. Uh, this person said, many of us physicians on this call are deeply concerned about the level of confidence being placed in weak data around treating gender distressed youth medications and surgery. I was disappointed not to be able to ask questions to Dr. Kuruglian about his interpretation of short-term mental health data and where he sees things going given the current direction of our European medical colleagues. This was just a statement. I do want to say that it is very disappointing um, when I reached out to about 20 people uh, to have this conversation, this very important conversation around uh, the data. And uh, this was supposed to be a civil conversation. And unfortunately, um, he, he was here. I didn't want to point that out. He decided that, um, he didn't want to share the data, but he was here um, uh, today. And then, um, and that's unfortunate. So the question for the two, um, you know, for Ed and, and Rebecca is, you know, how confident are you in the types of treatment protocols, your, to the, to the extent that that's something that you're saying, look, this is evidence-based, right? This is top down from the American Psychological Association, stamped of approval, this is what you know we're going to suggest. I, I'm not quite sure if that's that is what you suggest, but um, or is that how your services work? I think with Rebecca, for you it would, right? Because you're looking at these different treatment protocols. So um, can you address the concern that this person has that we're putting so much confidence in this weak data around treating gender distressed youth, distressed youth? Rebecca, if you'd like to go first. Yeah, well, I think I interpreted that comment a little differently. Um, and I think what I think is true, which is like, we're making a lot of large assumptions on all sides without really having a conversation about the data. Um, and, you know, there's there's still a lot to be discovered and known as we've, we've talked about. Um, and I'm definitely not an expert here, so should not be speaking about it. I can only talk about what I've seen anecdotally and what I know from my community and friends, um, because I do think that, you know, there's the people should get the type of care that they want and deserve. Um, in terms of our care programs, this is why we were founded by a doctor. This is how we, you know, oversee all of our care programs. This is why. Um, Helen is involved in all training of clinicians. We have very clear care pathways. We're constantly evaluating outcomes. Um, and that's, you know, that's the what we can do. Yeah, I think from our perspective, you know, we, we try to build a provider group that is uh, diverse by nature. So, um, and I, I don't want to narrow the, the conversation down, even though I know that's the, the, the core of the you know, question talking about treating uh, gender distressed youth. Um, you know, I, I think that um, you know whether it's whether whether um, we're talking about gender distressed youth, the LGBTQ plus community, or any other community really that's uh, presenting to us uh, in abundance in on college campuses. You know, we have to build a provider group that resembles some of the issues that we see on college campuses, and we have to provide our providers as well with the type of training and supervision that allows them to deliver a culturally competent care. So um, I would abstract the issue and say that, um, you know, we're kind of monitoring um, kind of the evolution of the presenting issues and making sure that we're looking at the latest data. 
uh, the extent to which, um, you know, I personally have a level of confidence on that data would be, um, you know, I don't think the, the extent that I'd, I'd wish to, to discuss today, but, but at least acknowledging that um, it is something that, that we are seeing and making sure that we have providers around that are able to support when um, we are seeing a, a student with um, uh, that presenting issue. And I will say also, I definitely echo all of that. And this is one of the benefits of virtual care is we talk about this a lot of, there is a lot of specialties and subspecialties and things that come up that need experts in certain areas. And one of the things that telemedicine can give us is you can match a family or a child with that specialist regardless of where they are, right? And so that people can get the best specialized care for what they need, you know, anywhere in the US. Obviously this goes back to the previous panel. There's a lot to do about regulation and legal issues to make that even easier, but I think it is a benefit of what um, Ed and I are working on. And, and uh, to follow up on that question, Rebecca and, and Ed, both of you, are you really getting the full profile of the page? Like, are you having the data, the right data to work with? So you could have really solid clinically evidence-based intervention, but are you getting the full spectrum of that individual? I wonder if you, the, the PH, and I'm a clinician myself, our assessment tools are quite limited. If you look at, you know, we are we are more kind of uh, one one size fits all. PHQ nine, GAT sevens, and 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 they're important, but then yeah. you don't know what they're. And I know we are harping on social media, but what is their social media profile? Do you have that in, information? So what Catherine mentioned is that. Do you know which rabbit hole they're, they're living in? Um, are you aware of, of, of what their self-perception is um, in that social media space? Like, I don't even think you have almost, the therapist has the knowledge about their alternate life that they're living to really intervene and, and, that, um, and, and provide more balanced intervention that is clinically sound. I mean, in terms of in terms of having a, a I think a, a full view of what has happened with a, a patient, and you know, I fully agree with you that um, you know, evidence based scales, as evidence based as we may call them, are subject to recency bias, um, and so you know, at, at least in terms of our our current referral flow and and how we tend to to deliver care, um, we we typically see patients within um, anywhere from three to five days from uh, the uh, digital intake being filled out and uh, an appointment being scheduled. And so um, from the moment that they fill that out to the moment they uh, get on uh, the, 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 the video session with one of our providers, uh, they, they may be in a totally different mindset. So that's the first thing that we see. Um, we, we have the ability to constantly monitor those scales. In fact, we have 100% um, scales completion um, and we tell health allows that because, you know, we literally have uh, uh, our students and our patients uh, fill out those scales every time before they join an appointment. So that gives us clean data um, on the progress of the patients that we see. Now, uh, to go back to your initial question, I think one of the benefits of collaborating with, um, you know, in-person clinics the way in which we we do it is that um, we are able to um, you know see the the student and get medical notes um, upon referral as well. So the student may sign up directly. They may also be referred by their counseling center, their health center, um, and so uh, we also have the ability to capture um, you know the assessment of someone on the ground that's seen this person physically, um, and so that is just an extra uh, data point for us to be able to to come in and have a full review of what's been happening with this um, with the student. Hey, Arshana, can we just, I wanna bring in Catherine really quick. We're about 10 minutes over, but I, I would like her to ask, uh, answer the question about uh, the evidence being weak for interventions. Yes. Um, I, I would echo the concerns of the person who wrote in that question. Um, a lot of the gender affirming surgeries and hormones do, do not have a long history in children and adolescents. Um, 
However, we do know from other endocrine studies that long-term use of uh, hormone replacement therapy does lead to problems with organ systems. And puberty is not only the development of secondary sex characteristics. It's something that affects you neurologically. It's something that affects you metabolically. It is something that affects every cell in your body. And so doing the, the studies that we do have um, when they are examined by other biostatisticians and not just the peer reviewers who are also the contributors and the editors of a couple of you know, journals that seem to publish a lot of related things, um, the evidence is and the methods are not very rigorous. And when this concern is raised by clinicians, because we're taught in medical school, not just to read the abstract and the conclusion, but also to look at how the data is collected, how, how it's interpreted, what were the methods used. When any concern has been brought up, letters to the editor or in other academic rebuttals, there is so much political and social pressure put on those clinicians that I've never seen any other clinical diagnosis get this kind of response. It's, it's, it's very emotional. I mean, as you know, when we go to medical conferences, we debate back and forth, is this treatment better? Is that treatment better? Yeah, but look at the study. It's not that hot. And in this case, there seems to be a real taboo against questioning any of these studies um, that show that uh, gender affirming care is anything other than um, positive. And these are surgeries that can never be reversed. Um, the puberty blockers and then together with the cross-sex hormones um, cause permanent infertility. Um, so, so we need to be debating these things without fear of causing offense or being canceled or alienating one another. We need to talk and think like clinicians who don't have a political agenda, but we all must respect each other as people who want the best for somebody who's in distress. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And I know we are on time, so I wanted to quickly uh, have us closing, um, closing comments, um, maybe in 30 seconds or less. Um, so Divya, I know you have to jump off, so I'll begin with you. And then I know, Helen, you have your hands up, so if you can include that as your 30-second comment. Thank you. Divya? I think, um, yeah, I think thanks for including me in this panel of very kind of thoughtful um, discussion here. Um, overall, I think technology companies have a role to play, um, but there is a lot of understanding we need to do on what and why, and then how we can enable some of the interventions that we've spoken about here. Um, technology companies can also play a role in gathering a lot of data that is that is missing to, to develop the therapies and to develop the interventions that we need going forward. Um, but it, I do think we have to, as we discussed, we have to come together as a community of various stakeholders and, and build, uh, build a solution that's right for the youth and the kids um, for the future. Uh, but thank you again. This is a wonderful conversation. Thank you, Diva. And um, Helen, um, I'm going to send it to you. And and if you all of you can weave in what we 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 can do to positively change this. Yes. So I was going to say that the sort of research that's needed is so difficult to do because it's always very difficult to say what worked and were the people who got an intervention, you know, the same in every respect as the people who didn't get an intervention and so on. And this is one place where the UK can really, really help because we have a national healthcare system. And obviously that has pluses and minuses. But one thing it does mean is that you look across the whole population and you can gather data for the whole population. So the changes that are being made to the way that in particular gender distressed children are being treated, part of the specification is high quality research. Mm -hmm. So every child who, who receives certain interventions, that'll be long term tracked. So we will be able to tell you from the UK if you wait a while what the outcomes are for different sorts of treatment. And I think that will be really, really helpful for everyone in the world. And that's a bit positive. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Rebecca, you're next on my screen. Great. I mean, I think back to your further question, I think doing comprehensive 
full assessments. And I will say a little otter, we've developed our own family mental health checkup. That is not just the PHQ-9. We do that screening regularly. It was developed by um, Alan uh, based on evidence-based practices to really understand what is going on with the entire family so we can more efficiently provide care. Um, and I'm just really excited about all of the work that's being done in this space and how we are able to have this conversation. And you know, children have had suicide ideation for a very, very long time, and we are finally talking about it. And that is exciting because it means we can start to make it to have an impact. Thank you. Um, Ed? Yeah, I'll, I'll quickly say that um, as a closing statement, you know, to me, one of the biggest issues that we're still facing as a, as a nation is uh, the shortage of clinicians. And so um, if we can come together um, to further encourage, you know, people to pursue, uh, you know, uh, a, a track to become licensed or to pursue, you know, graduate studies to be able to, you know, a get better research um, to support some of the um, issues that we discussed today, but be also uh, be able to, um, you know, further our, our pool of clinicians across the the country. Uh, at Mantra, we um, offer a, um, a scholarship every year to. Uh, graduate students of color at different institutions to be able to pursue uh, their career. And so um, I'd like to encourage more and more communities to, to push that forward as a career path and make sure that we continue to have uh, a wider pool to support um, the um, issues that we're seeing in this community. So that's my, my closing statement. Thank you. That's very positive. Thank you, Ed. How about you, Catherine? Um, I'd like to say that social media is neither good nor bad in and of itself. It is an extremely powerful tool. We know that it has a very high potential for being addicting. So when it's used for connection, it can be very powerfully good. Um, and when it is used in a negative way, it can be quite damaging. Um, but no social media can replace face-to-face um, -face connection and attention from people in the real world. So anybody who's listening, if you're a parent, please know exactly what your children are doing online. The way that you would not send them to a friend's house until you met that friend or you wouldn't let them run down the street not knowing where they were headed because uh, you know, when they're on that screen and they have access to the entire internet, it's like they can go anywhere. Thank you, thank you. Bambi? Um, I think we, you know, I've said quite a bit already. And so since we're about 20 minutes late already for our next panel, maybe we should just- uh, yeah, jump into the next Thank you everyone for, for calling in from all over. I know Helen is the UK. Catherine, you in Italy? Where are you these days? Oh, I'm I'm in West Africa today. Okay. Oh, just today. Okay. Just today. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you so thank, much. Thank you everyone for joining in. Thank, thank you. you. And with in a